No single event has influenced the development of modern art as profoundly as World War I. That quote comes directly from the textbook. And besides the development of photography, I would say that, yes, this statement is very, very true. World War I was a horrific battle, the first time we have a worldwide conflict, a war fought with poison gas and trench warfare, our first war fought with tanks and airplanes. 25 million people are injured in the war horrifically, 10 million people are killed, and it affects artists tremendously. Of course, you have many of the futurist artists, for instance, being killed in the war. But those that didn't fight in the war were still affected. When you think of Picasso, the leading artist of abstraction, all of a sudden he goes to painting very classical images, very much in the style of Michelangelo. But art does continue on. It emerges with Dada after the war. And the term Dada itself is a very unique word. In English, of course, it sounds like baby talk. But in French, it translates to hobby horse. In Russian, Dada means yes, yes, while in Romanian, it means no, no. And the emergence of Dada is quite unique because everything up to now, when we've studied modern art, really emerges from Paris, with the exception of futurism. But here we have an art movement that emerges simultaneously from four different cities, Zurich, New York, Berlin, and Paris. Up until now, we've been arguing the idea of tradition. What is the correct way of painting an object? When we look at Manet's Luncheon on the Grass, this has been, up till now, the most scandalous painting because it pushes the boundaries of what is acceptable art, at least the acceptable way of creating it. The idea of the nude figure being created without the semitones, without the use of the technique of chiaroscuro. Manet's lack of linear perspective. The idea of narrative being lost in this work. And of course, visible brush strokes. But now Dada comes around and forces us to answer a bigger question. What is art? And it's very unique to see the types of art that emerges from these cities. Up in Zurich, we have people like Hugo Ball reciting his sound poem at the Cabaret Voltaire, where he's dressed up very similar to the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz. And he recites poems that sound like Zim, Zim, Zimbala, Zam. His argument is that the human figure can exist in abstraction and in poetry, he is abstracting words. Over in Berlin, we have photo montage heralded by the female artist Hannah Hock. And with her works, she cuts out pictures and newsprint from magazines and newspapers and creates artwork that deals with current events, such as this one here, which deals with women in the workforce. We also have John Hartfeld, who argues against the rise of Hitler with his photo montage. Over in New York, we have photography going on, such as the work by Man Ray at the right. And he also created the sculpture at the left, which is a flat iron that has 14 tacks glued to the base of it, making it unusable. But really, the most significant city that we see Dada in is Paris. And 
it's led there by the artist Marcel Duchamp, who today, if you continue to study art history, and particularly art history theory, we have a tremendous amount of credit that we have to give him um, for making art dealing with conceptual activities. Now, Marcel uh, is originally Hungarian, but spends most of his life in Paris. And then during the World War II, um, he moves to the United States, uh, uh, originally to New York, but eventually over to Southern California. And he was trained as a Cubist artist, very much in the same way uh, of Picasso. Um, he was the one who created the famous new Descending a Staircase. But we're also going to look um, at his ready-mades in this work, in this lecture. Uh, new Descending a Staircase is a abstracted form that's moving from the upper left down to the lower right. Uh, it was a painting that first made headlines in America when it was shown in the famous Armory Show of 1913 and it was ridiculed. We didn't understand this painting. It was the first time Americans had seen European modern art and abstraction, and we really didn't know how to take it and what to do with it. And um, so he became famous or infamous with this work. Now, ready-mades are already constructed objects. And especially, as you can imagine, in the early 1900s, how humorous these might have looked in a museum. Ready-mades are the transformation of commonly manufactured objects into works of art. But what we've done really is bypassed the artist himself, that we don't have to have a God-given talent, any artistic talent, in order to create these works. Craftsmanship has gone out the window. We are creating basically a mechanical process more than anything. So it is a full-on assault of the artistic tradition. And here's a, a couple more ready-mades, the snow shovel at the left, and then the image of the Mona Lisa at the right is what's called an assisted ready-made, uh, which he took a manufactured postcard and added the goatee and mustache to her and adding the letters L-H-O-O-Q when pronounced rapidly in French, uh, there's a, a sexual innuendo about that phrase. And so what he's done really is he's taken the most beloved, uh, admired work of Western art and ridiculed it, made fun of it. And that's really uh, very similar in essence to the futurists that these people hated the past and they were looking for a new type of art. Now with Dada, this is probably the most famous image of any of the artworks. Uh, Fountain is by the artist Marcel Duchamp, but he signs the work, as you can see in the lower left-hand corner, R. Mutt which is a takeoff on the name of the manufacturer of the urinal of which this is. What happens is the artist takes this to an art exhibition, uh, pays $6 for its admittance, and it's removed from the show floor. And he writes about this Duchamp writes about this incident in a magazine called The Blind Man, and he calls it the Richard Mutt case. He says, quote, They say that any artist paying $6 may exhibit. Mr. Richard Mutt sent in a fountain, and without discussion this article disappeared and never was exhibited. What were the grounds for refusing Mr. Mutt's fountain? First, some contend it was immoral or vulgar. And others say that it was plagiarism. This was a plain piece of plumbing. Now we can toss aside number one pretty easily. The idea that Mr. Mutt's fountain is not immoral, no more than the bathtub is immoral. 
It's the fixture that we see every day in a plumber store window. What's important really is part two, which is the idea of plagiarism, that it's been called a plain piece of plumbing. Marcel Duchamp says whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance. The thing is, he chose it. He took an ordinary article of life, placing it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view. He created a new thought for that object. So what he's done really is he stated that art has become conceptual, meaning that the idea behind the work is more important than the work itself. And even though this is in the early 1900s, it's going to set the stage for the contemporary era of art, post-1945, post-World War II. And again, we're looking back at Duchamp as one of the leaders for this movement.